welcome which that world that mediation in our culture and traditions i mean with 97 speakers with you know, of course with 45 countries back to back and you had to finish it on time because the other person will not get time otherwise and everyone should get their time it's not that because sure. one person wanted to speak a little longer but the last session definitely that can go on for as long so you've got the last session today and the last session okay. in, the, in the symposium so we can go on as long as you want so farzeen thank, thank you very much for being part of the symposium i know there were okay. some issues that you were facing at home personal level i hope they're okay things are thank you things have normaled up a little bit yeah <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. God, yeah. Perfect. So, of course, you're going to tell us about yourself and about the symposium. If you want, you can get me in for thirty seconds. I'll just put that website up to tell people where information is whenever you want me to do that. So, please, it's your show. I am here, but I'm not here. I come in when you want me to come in. Please. Sure, I can. Uh, I can introduce myself and then uh, toss it over to you to kind of give a give your. Uh, you know view of the, the the symposium and everything and the logistics um now first off i'm i'm honored here to to kind of be on 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 this program i you know uh i always like kind of uh opportunities to have these conversations outside of just like a you know western dominated frameworks and kind of we were we were chatting a little bit um before about how like uh it's refreshing to see such uh uh you know space built on organic dialogue and conversation see where it takes us um because like uh you know we were talking about the point about how like our lives are so just like incredibly structured and there's so much time and effort that goes into the back end for things to uh for the final product to be just so incredibly airtight and then it's it's it kind of puts us in a space where like Oh man that's that's so much you know and it's just it's one thing on top of another and then just having just a, a just the space to have like free flow of information free flow of thought is just refreshing i mean it's not something that we're used to and especially in our very highly proceduralized highly structured lives that it is a nice break in a respite and a part of i think decolonization actually um before we get into that though Uh let me introduce myself. So uh my name is Farzeen. I was born in Iran. Um moved to the US when I was 5, I was toward the tail end of the with my mom. Uh my dad was already here. Uh toward the tail end of the Iran-Iraq war. Um still going on. We had uh we had escaped to uh Turkey. My aunts were studying in Turkey. Um uh and the reason for that is like I'm ethnically Azerbaijani so we grew up speaking a Turkic language so it was easy to to kind of pick up Turkish so we stayed there for a little bit we're able to come to US uh um on asylum uh actually my father had gotten asylum and I think we kind of you know got somehow put, put in with that uh so grew up in the US grew up in the kind of D- Washington DC area um you know had different kind of experiences with like you know being uh um different in multiple spaces not just uh being different kind of growing up uh in the United States among you know my peers but also not really fitting into the Iranian diaspora groups either like uh you know because uh um now my native tongue isn't farsi it's you know it's azerbaijani and so like uh you know farsi was a kind of almost like a foreign language to us like we had to learn and so there's a lot of that that kind of shaped my life a little bit i would say so um it kind of uh you know led me to explore my own identity led me to explore like othering letting let me explore like ethnicity and nationalism all these things in college and grad school um did human rights work at immediately afterwards so you will see a lot of what i talk about peppered with like the language of social justice you know not typically like uh i don't use a lot of the the more business related talk when it comes to diversity equity and inclusion um so that's cuz that's cuz of my specific background in, in in human rights work um spent my 20s doing a lot of that i got a chance to kind of go to the un minority rights forum i wrote some speeches that were presented uh you know global level un um uh was an advocate a, a sort of activist for my uh ethnicity i um you know uh, st- uh received my masters in international affairs um worked and uh went kind of did a soul searching thing in baku azerbaijan for two years uh did a second masters there 
um, in diplomacy and international affairs, came back to the U.S. The idea was to actually kind of go into the foreign service, um, you know, State Department. Uh, that didn't work out, but, uh, you know, when I came back to the U.S., I was able to find a job in local university doing talent acquisition work and uh, advocated for myself. I was like, you know, I'm really interested in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Like there's uh, there's quite a bit of, um, you know, overlap and, and uh, skill building there. While I was there, I received a certificate in conflict resolution um, because I was very interested in uh, particularly um, inter-ethnic conflict and, and, and politics, um, both within countries and between countries. And that's what I, you know, focus my graduate degrees on. Um, and then one thing led to another. I enjoyed it. I loved it. Stayed in the space. Uh, did DI, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion work for big companies, um, large corporate law, local government, um, uh, which was uh, cool because that also shaped not only my interactions with the workforce, but also um had a client, uh, we call client, but the citizen uh, facing function as well. So we were looking at um, deconstructing racialized policies in the United States over time, particularly in our jurisdiction in Arlington County. Uh, so that was a very enlightening experience. And then I started my own consultancy um, <laughs> during during the start of the pandemic. So uh, June, summer of 2020, June 2020 is when I, when I started and I've been kind of uh, 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 doing work out on my own. A couple of months ago, I also uh, picked up a, a full-time role um, as a global DEI strategist and trainer with a company called Power to Fly. And it's been great so far. And here I am. Uh, all of my <laughs> all of my backgrounds kind of like the, and experience has kind of shaped where I am today and seeing where it goes from here on out. So that's me. I'll I'll toss it back to you if you have any questions or if you want to introduce or kind of give some logistical background to the to the symposium. The important thing is, Fazin, you haven't told us you, what I should have written there. The organizational justice guy. That's who <laughs> Fazin is. That's right. Yeah. On my okay. So if you go to my LinkedIn, uh, yeah. Same first name and last name, right? Um, I kind of tongue in cheek, but also somewhat serious. Uh, 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 scrap my entire LinkedIn title with like all these like different uh, areas of interest and just wrote the organizational justice guy. And that's because, um, you know, uh, that's actually, I'm very happy you brought that up because that's a strong element of my background. So like uh, I'm no longer calling myself a diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner. Um, I've stumbled uh, over the past few years, I stumbled upon this like somewhat uh, still very academic, but uh, you know, tiny bit popular uh, field called organizational justice. Um, and I, you know, uh, we can talk about that too, but in my impression, organizational justice is still, um, and it's a good topic for this conversation, is it's still very Eurocentric, right? Like a lot of the framing and things like that are still based on what, you know, we we in the United States or Germany or, or Netherlands think of as fairness. Um, and so my my whole thing was to uh, I love the term organizational justice because I'm getting like you know the, the the field of DEI is just adding on acronyms and it's like becoming very you know there's Jedi there's DEIA there's DEIB there's a lot of different things and so like uh, organizational justice is very clean um, I like a lot of the framing of it um, the issue I think is to uh, kind of decolonize it right like and, and make it accessible to uh, every culture around the planet um, in uh, dynamic so so I started like just in in on LinkedIn calling myself the organizational justice guy because I don't see anybody else I see maybe, I've seen maybe one or two people post on it um, but uh, the idea is to kind of adopt it but also mold it to be much more um, culturally inclusive. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice thing. It's a broader, broader aspect. There's lots more happening. It's not maybe not just DEI. There's a lot of other things happening with it. So that's, I think, and the mindset part of it that you're saying, I think that's important, which is going to come up here. Definitely is going to come right. up. But should I have also added Azerbaijan in that? Azerbaijan, Iran, and USA. Shouldn't that be nice? Uh, sh sure. I mean, I lived in Azerbaijan for two years. Then they um, so And I'm eth ethnically Azerbaijani. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so it should so, be up there. I mean, it should be. Oh, why did I not get this earlier? That poster would have looked so much nice with three flags with Farzi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. Well, I don't know. Like, I mean, that I'm always apprehensive because, like, that the kind. I like. I don't want to represent. Uh, you know, like I, I, I'm. I mean, I should be more modest about that. Like, I, uh, you know, I'm just kind of like, do, can I, can I speak for, for anybody outside of me specifically you know like i i can't really speak for uh, somebody else's flag and that kind of thing but i mean that's part of my identity so as we're as you're as you're talking it through as this whole like real real time dialogue i'm it's, i'm becoming softer to the idea so yeah feel free uh no, because what i was telling you while we were having that conversation because maybe con- not consciously but maybe subconsciously all that we are just living in a place for two years i mean and of course you have that ethnic background all that what you bring in i mean uh, in terms of look finally it's the mindset whatever mm-hmm. comes out of it is picking up from a lot of aspects you're staying in the us or you're growing up in iran or the azerbaijani aspect of it is coming out and it's important for us to also like i said know this person is someone from iran and you might have known someone from iran but that word person is not representing iran and to say anyone represents any place i mean it should not be the way people go but that's the stereotype that they create so that's why it's important i think up till now someone with an azerbaijani background they might never have met but here we have farzeen here so yeah. why not uh, that that's a good point I, like i think i'm like so far i've seen maybe like one of t- two or three people like that i've ever seen in in social media that are from azerbaijani backgrounds that are uh, in this space so like um and and somebody uh, and i think like well you know uh, aside from my 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 business partner and i she's also uh azerbaijani from iran i don't like but she she's more in the you know diversity people analytics area um more data science uh stuff like that and so like uh, uh specifically somebody that you know from my background that does from my very specific background that does the trainings and stuff like that i think i'm the only one i would love to connect with more people uh that that you know speak the language that are uh kind of shared experiences you know but maybe th- this will open that up hopefully yeah. somebody's viewing exactly just this combination i mean it's an amazing combination azerbaijan iran usa organizational justice guy what uh, else do we need <laughs> Just keep but, tacking them on, right? Like, <laughs> I'm sure there will be more things as we talk. Like, oh yeah, that's nice to let's put that down there. Also, add that we to... have a whole resume going down. There. <laughs> but okay, that's so funny. let me just put, put that up. Let me put it up. I'd like to put it up only because of the fact, like, because I think I mean, I mean, like, I keep saying more than 400. I think more than 425 videos up there. If you go wow. to YouTube, definitely, how would you really find out what's really happening there? so the website mediatorvikram.com idea was more like it's more like an index i would call it more like an index concept but at some stage of course connecting all that is everything i i've tried to keep it at as accessible click here send a whatsapp message kind of thing so be accessible of course hmm. the support the world mediation circle is something which of course i would like to discuss with you if we would have read it it would have been nice but i'll take you through that shows and events is where the current schedule is available and schedule it's simple excel sheet i don't like to complicate things because i don't i, I keep churning out content i don't have time to put it present it in a nice way so just an excel sheet youtube links out there similarly with uh, there was a, a symposium on indigenous peoples and mediation in august so that came up that that schedule is also up here and then we have one on heart soul spirituality and mediation is the youtube playlist this is an area which i really feel that has got left out in the larger discussion on mediation so i had one mm-hmm. symposium on that then indigenous peoples and mediation the schedule is here as this world mediators conference there were 93 sessions there the format was you to tell me what topic you want to discuss we'll discuss that topic so everyone gave their topics so we had 93 sessions happening there were 80 speakers there wow and then we had this world peacemakers day celebration because the so thing is 18th may is ken close birthday celebrating that as world mediators day 
because finally i said someone has to celebrate it <laughs> the un is not celebrating it so might as well do it same thing with the peacemakers thing let's put it out and i just feel it's better to celebrate it in connection with someone living <laughs> someone gone by i think there's lots of celebrations happening with that person so that's how it is and then of course there are various shows the various shows the evolution of a mediator I, I'm taking you briefly through it because, Farzeen, I just want you to be interested so that maybe at one point of time you'll watch them also. The idea was <laughs> that mediators are not made in 40-hour factories. They're, what Farzeen has gone through, just the fact that he grew up in Iran and he came to the US, what he went through. It's something that is so, first of all, unique to him and how it shaped his mind and everything that went around him is important as him being the person he is. Let's not put it down to, oh, he went for a 40-hour thing and he became a mediator. We'll make you a mediator. I'm totally against that. You'll hear me say this a lot of times. So this series started. We started with Ken Cloak. So very interesting. I mean, the, his life, how he grew up, everything. So it's down to, back to maybe if a can, person can take us to grandparents growing up, if they have that much information. Of course, their parents, because all that in some way connects to you and makes you what you are. In the symposium, we had someone from Canada, uh, I mean, someone from the indigenous community was there, and he spoke about his trauma. He was in a residential school, and his mother was in a residential wow. school, what she went through. So we were talking about intergenerational trauma, that part of it. So everything that you've gone through influences what you are. Then we had Andrea from Iran, Ireland. She was not willing to come into the symposium. She said, what am I going to talk about? And then she thought about it and she brought in this intergenerational trauma aspect of how Ireland was affected and what all they went through. So everything connects to who you are. I mean, let's not put it down to simple things. So that is what that series was. Okay. In Conversation with the Beautiful Mind is just a conversation. Exactly what you were saying. Just let it go wherever it goes. We don't know what we're going to be talking about. And the lectures about mediation was let's put up something for people who in some way let's connect them to mediation they might get inspired to take it up and connect to that aspect of themselves so let's get the best in the world to talk about it this is now going to become a more structured program which i'm going to do after this symposium talking books because some of us don't read them which is me so let's talk about talked about the books so we've had that mediate experience is just anyone talking. this was basically weinstein jams fellows we're talking to Mediator reflects Michael Lang is in terms of reflective practice, he's doing he's someone known for that. So we started wow. that series. This series is going to take up because he's in some personal things he's involved in, but he's going to come out of that and we'll discuss that. So that's how things are. And I won't take more of your time. There's lots, I mean, there's YouTube channel, all the various things are there. I mean, all that. I won't take your time. Ken Cloak, of course. That's been, awesome. So Ken has been on various shows. So all those links are here. There's a playlist also. So that's up there. Okay, what I need to show you is, yes, okay, this all that is there. But interesting was the symposium last year, which this is Rafael in Mexico. He made this poster on the poster of Woodstock. Woodstock. <laughs> that's great. Oh, lovely. I like the whole concert. Really creative. So this was where that was, 97 speakers for 45 countries. So, so Next year, we're going to have that. It's, it's here, I've broken it up into indigenous peoples and mediation and colonization, decolonization. Next year, we'll have it as mediation in our culture and traditions. And let's make it big, as big as we can. So mm. that's how it is. So, Farzee, that's about this. Needed to put it Very out there. Cool. So yeah, that's lot awesome. Of, that, that's a lot of great programming that you've, you've developed. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's, it's just that, like I said, I, I think I've put out too much content. This has happened, what, in one and a half years? So in one and a half years, I think there's about wow. 500 or 600 hours of programming on my channel. <laughs> so, so you can imagine. That's incredible. On an average, how much time I've spent on an average per day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, I hope you're giving yourself some time to rest. I you know I, that I do that. I do that. I have, I have broken up my life into my goals my work and this but I, I mean i'm like that balance i've always had and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and i really i'm telling you these are i do not have to like like we just discussed it's an organic conversation so then nothing no i don't need any preparation for it technology right. has made it so simple i am not here to in some way work on those videos and present them well or anything it's a conversation people just want to listen to a conversation uh, hi am i packaging it very nicely and slick kind of thing not required i mean i can't do yeah. it yeah 
so it's yeah i i could see i mean like the the way the conversations go like i, I see i could see myself kind of uh listening to it in a car ride you know just uh kind of like uh um, in the background, just listen to just real live kind of more, more so like podcasty style, yeah, yeah. you know, chat. So that's that's really cool. Well, that's interesting. What I'm going to do now is I'll put them all on the podcast. I put some some on the podcast. I'll put all of them, all these links that you are seeing on the symposium conference. I'll put them up. I didn't. And this was like back to back. You know, May May June conference, August the symposium, September this symposium. So now world mediation circle and putting it all together so i'll have you'll have all everything on the podcast now let's start oh, with putting good. everything that ken has spoken about let's put that on the podcast all of that right and let's pick up all of them so so first you now it's all you cool. and it's all about you and me decolonization decolonization and mediation so please sure so uh i was kind of you know i mean I'm not an active mediator and uh, I was kind of thinking about like the, my experiences with uh, kind of just tangentially doing like, uh, or being part of the, uh, being in the room, but more so as a person who kind of understands like intercultural relationships and uh, like, uh, and so I wanted to kind of uh, figure out like, as I was kind of chatting, like thinking through like where, where I want to take this, um, is fundamentally, I think one conversation, like a conversation that we need to do a better job about. And I've spoken this uh, to, to, to mediation circles about this is, um, is that, and I'm not sure what it's like in other parts of the world, um, is that we here in the US uh, tend to look at sort of conflict and mediation um, as a, so uh, the mediation as like the fix, right? So it is a, it is a temporary break in the cog of a machine that you have to fix. And in order to fix that, you have to go through a certain procedure and a process on a very clunky, um, you know, almost like non-human, non-personal me uh, methodology to kind of get to a resolution and that resolution is a almost is commodified and productized, right? You're like, this is what we've, this is the, we're going to this end goal. We have to fix it so we can go back to work or we can go back to doing things in the, in the house. And so like, um, uh, and I think for us to kind of, uh, uh, I think, and that's first off very detrimental because one, you know, in that process, you don't address core roots of, of, of the causes of conflict and two um it doesn't fix anything is it's, it's going to come back it can be temporary right it's a fleeting kind of moment of a fix but like you're not like uh um it, you know it's 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 almost like uh um what is the term when they make the uh light bulbs like uh purposely like have a lifespan, uh, manu I think it's called manufactured obsolescence. Like I kind of see that a little bit. I, I saw that a lot when I was doing, um, when I was in the rooms and stuff like that. And so um, I would, I would uh, think to myself, like, you know, people don't talk like this. Like, it's like one person, next person, they say what they have to say, then they, and then they go into the fine details of things. And there's no first level setting and understanding really, where somebody comes from, but also um, the biggest, I think, thing I wanted to highlight is that in these spaces, we don't necessarily talk about power as a mechanism or power as a uh, force of not just a specific space, like who has power in this room, this is mostly the mediator and they're, you know, they're giving time so for somebody to speak and they're managing the conversation, but like power over uh, history and, and uh, society and um, the relationship of, you know, colonization. Right. So without that knowledge, it, you know, we come to this room where two people may be in conflict and the room I'm, I'm saying metaphorically doesn't like, I'm not just speaking about a mediation room where it's two people, three people are, I'm talking about like in in the in the space of a conflict, we encapsulate it so that um, without that knowledge of history, time, like 
intergenerational trauma, all these things, we view these two individuals in a very equal plane. This person's grieving this, this person's grieving this, we view that as equal, then they discuss, and then product, which is conflict resolution, right? Um, but there's so many other societal dynamics at play, like the, the nature of expressions of systems of power over time has created, um, you know, both psychologically and uh, materially in our lives, uh, different responses to some things that may seem very small, right? Um, if, if the conflict is something around, somebody says something, you know, ch racially charged, racist, or like, uh, you know, somewhat harmful, um, you can kind of encapsulate in that room. It was like, this person said something mean and done, right? Apologize and we're, we're good. It doesn't necessarily work that way, right? This, this one comment could have been just the straw that broke the camel's back in an entire, not just in that person's lifetime, but their parents, their grandparents, you know, their ancestors, uh, both material deprivation of uh, survival and thriving, right? Like, you know, uh, racialized policies, uh, uh, coloniza colonization policies. And then on top of that, layers and layers of mythologies about these people that they're backward, they're far from divine, like we're, you know, we're culturally and genetically superior and all these things. In that one moment, right, somebody may have said something that alludes to that isn't, we can't just isolate that, right? We have to look at the trajectory of it. And so when I think like uh, in, in, in spaces of mediation, like, um, not only is that ever present, the history of, you know, uh, of pro like these societal systemic structures of oppression and colonization, but it's also that like, um, it's, it's like we're prescribing methodologies as if that never existed, but in a way that it's driven by capitalism. It, it's driven by a production consumption, right? You know, uh, you produce the, the the resolution and then you consume it, you're done for that moment. And then if it happens again, you do the same thing, right? And so um, I think, I mean, and, and these two things aren't separate, they're connected, they're deliberately done, right? Like, you know, colonization and capitalism are, you know, intertwined. Um, one's a, actually the evolution of, 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 of another, right? like the specific form of capitalism we have across the globe that is extractive, right? That is exploitative, right? And so I think like in, in, our, uh, in our areas, we have to be much more mindful of what is going to lead to true healing in a space. And that is better conflict resolution or dispute resolution down the road. Um, and so like how, like, how do we do that? I think, uh, um, a lot of it, you know, a lot of it comes from pre-colonial knowledge. Like, uh, you know, uh, a lot of our cultures have very advanced ways of dealing with things where it's not just a, here's a list of things to do. Here's the prescription. Here's the, uh, you know, the solution. And, and bam, no, it's, it's like a true deep, on a deep human connection level getting a sense for understanding where, where somebody is and understanding like exactly, like I said, these series of historical things that have happened to bring us to this point. And I think uh, that's something in, in mediation um, and conflict resolution, dispute resolution, um, we, we need to do a much better job of. Um, there are, you know, a lot, a lot of cultures that speak to kind of creating just the the space of healing, you know, like what kind of, you know, if if you if you're putting yourself into a, doing breathing exercises, if you're putting yourself into the mode of tearing down um, walls that and tearing down like this drive to win or us like assault somebody else in in the room, like to the point where I'm going to extract the most concessions out of this session, or I'm going to. If I, if, if I win at least 80% 80, 80 of the, not just like if, if there's a dispute, like a monetary you know, game, but actually 80% of the sympathy from the mediator or somebody else in the room of like, hey, I'm right, right? You're, you're trying, 
you're not you're, like that's not that that is part of this like extractive sort of col- colonial mentality it's all rooted in power like and and the idea is to uh in the outset kind of break that and a lot of cultures do that a lot better than we do here in, in the western world you know so i'm gonna pause there um if there's anything like that you want me to kind of explore a little bit i mean i can keep going forever but well, you will you go know. on forever you will but i'm just saying that this is in a way colonization of mediation which is happening and this is where i i mean talking about what i need to do is let me just put up because obviously you, you would not have gone onto the website and i just showed you the website but i didn't take you through that but let me tell you there's one paragraph from the world mediation circle which i want you to read whether it, sure. i mean it connects with you whether we, it's a work in progress we can add more to it so let's just have a look at this paragraph and does it fit into what you were saying this why part of it i can increase the size if you Brilliant. want I love it. Yeah. And we can add more to it if you, I mean, we, this, like I said, we can, it's a thought process which we, I'm developing because I feel there is a colonization of mediation which has happened and which is happening and we need to, mm-hmm. so I would want, I'm trying to stop it as much as I can. And for that, it's not easy, definitely, because it is a box which has already been thrown around and that's what people think is mediation. And this is why, why colonization? because your method is inferior my method is superior your mm-hmm. mediator is inferior my <laughs> mediator is superior that's what's happening and that's what i am trying to fight against <laughs> so. right actually i mean it's it's incredible how interconnected all these things are like i think like just the framing of how we approach humanity our environment our lifestyles um there can be a lot of alignment around the, uh, in that across the globe like um as you like kind of you're saying in my field you know one of the things that i'm looking at um and uh and there is like you know diversity if you think diversity equity inclusion there's also some sort of like colonization there so even a field is designed specifically to increase representation from people around the world you know like uh uh not just europeans and their descendants um Right. And not just like straight, uh, you know, able bodied, you know, like really increase the is still very much colonized. Like the procedures, the the way of getting to results is still very Eurocentric. It's still rooted in American and Dutch and British, um, English, uh, uh, French, German business styles, you know. Um, I, there are variances, obviously, within those cultures, but like, you know, specifically when it comes to, um, uh, I will say more so uh, American Dutch, kind of American Dutch British, like a very highly structured, um, almost like a uh, mechanized way of, um, and, and this is kind of, this is their historical trajectory, right? They, like uh, when when they were even colonizing, they mechanized everything, everything became a, uh, a a procedural bureaucratic process, right? Um, and other cultures uh, don't have that. Things are, as we were talking about, things are much more organic. They flow. Like in my culture, like uh, you know, like in Middle Eastern cultures, Muslim cultures, like you, you, a lot of hand gestures. You go back and forth, and then finally you reach some sort of consensus on something, right? Like it's, uh, you know, and uh, and it can it can lead to different types of emotions, but like we're not hiding those. It's it, emotions. It's emotions are on our sleeve. They're out there, right? There's no use in 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 making everybody just here's the level we we don't want to cross. Like we don't want to show anger. We don't want to show sadness. We just want to win in this conversation. We want uh, to extract as much as you know as much as the sympathy and you know whatever we're mediating uh, as possible. So. I totally, I, I love that. And so like in my field, and I kind of went on tangent here, but like in my field, uh, we're, we're looking at kind of ways as well uh, of that as well. Is the process of getting to diversity, equity, and inclusion actually Eurocentric or is it inclusive to multiple value systems across the world, right? Um, and so like actually one of the things that, you know, uh, a friend of mine, Warren Wright, um, 
uh, as second wave uh, uh, learning here in, in this area, in the Washington, D.C. area, we're, we're looking at is like, you know, the question we're asking is, is inclusion inclusive, right? So who's like, whose idea, you know, or process are you using? And the idea like for us is um, we can, we can, the processes we're building isn't to kind of get to the result. The process is to, to increase the number of voices in the room, if not like break the room altogether and be truly democratic in, in kind of extracting exactly the information that we need um, to design processes or to design interventions or design strategies. Like I can't know everything about every single culture on the planet or identity about every, every single person and their specific um, uh, identity category that they, uh, that they uh, um, identify with, like, on, 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 it's impossible. But what I can do is I can learn from multiple ways of doing things and kind of start to design ways of ex- like really getting that information, excuse me, getting that information from multiple areas. So I can be like, okay, so based on what we've dis- uh, we've learned, like um, let's collectively work together to z- design a system that doesn't make one culture superior to another that's truly inclusive right and it's a difficult prospect you know it's an, it's not something that's easy otherwise like you know if uh everybody you know could, could just do this on their own and we wouldn't have such a hard time like um deconstructing supremacy you know supremacy culture like uh, deconstructing like eurocentricism or deconstructing whatever like whatever country we're in or the dominant frameworks in those countries it's not easy. And so like, I think like that's the evolution of things. And I think that aligns well with what you're doing um, is that uh, like, you know, we, to, to look at what decolonization is, I think has multiple, um, you know, theories and ideas. One is the physicality, like the literal removal of a particular dominant framework from a space, like a, the physical decolonization. And the other is like decolonization of, processes of our minds right like of how we think is our is our is the thing that we're indoctrinated into natural to us right is it like uh is the process that we use natural to us in our cultures or it was something we learned or imposed on us that we have to do expend lots of mental energy doing but it's not culturally specific it's not the way we used to do things it's just something we learned right and something we learned is always much more mentally draining than something that we grew up doing, right? Or learn from our parents or learn from our ancestors. So um, all that to say, like, you know, uh, I love where you're taking with this with, and I, uh, taking it. And I think like, there's a lot of opportunity to truly um, deconstruct what, you know, the process of mediation are. Yeah, but I think the whole concept of decolonizing the mind when you said physical, actually removal of the physical structures, that also didn't happen. We've retained everything. <laughs> the courts have been the same courts that were set up by them. It is that whole, I mean, I was just talking right. to Ijeoma. In Nigeria, they have given up the wig. In India, at least, we've given up the wig, but we still, the right. same robe, same robe that we speak, what was given to us. And not practical, everyone is wearing that that suit into the court in a place where it's not air conditioned and whether you can understand what the weather is but they're continuing that the structure of the court the judge sitting up there everything so we, if if you take out the physical aspect of it maybe you'll slowly be able to decolonize the mind but today you walk in and i'm talking about the dispute resolution system the same thing if you look at the army the same drill the, in all the ceremonial things, the same thing we continue yeah. with the uniform, everything. So how do you decolonize the mind when you continue giving the same images all the time? So how do you do that? So that's, I think, one challenge for sure. The mm-hmm. other aspect is, I mean, I, I, I was listening to it when I was studying at Joma. Now the whole idea next month, or let's see when that happens. Let's see, let's just, what, however you can do it, but it's not happening to people. Let's try it just come with a blank slate blank canvas and let's start working on developing a system which could be unique to a 
this country or a region, whatever it has to be, or can we look at it globally if, if it works out that there are commonalities which are coming together if it, on a global thing? It's us sitting together and doing it. We don't have everything doesn't have to be something that the world has to adopt or the governments have to adopt. We have a sure. little world where we start just the whole idea of the circles. Let's just do it in this world. Mm-hmm. No one can stop you from resolving a dispute between yourself. No government in the world can do that. So you sit, you create that little circle there mm-hmm. and create the environment that you want to. Let's see how it works. I mean, if you have to tomorrow tell people that, okay, decolonization is possible and these people are doing it, let's set that up. So that's the way I'm looking at it. I love that because uh, that speaks to the power of like localization, right? Like it's, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, specifically like small spaces and then extrapolating out. And um, as somebody who is big on local governance, you know, because I work in local government and like the tr- seeing the power of of small spaces as generators for ideas. And, and, and making it like uh, small enough that you can experiment and figure that out. I think that that speaks to me. Um, per, on a personal note, like, you know, I was very like growing up, like uh, very interested in international stuff, right? Like I went in international affairs. I want to do diplomacy. I want to do, and like uh, the big world stuff, like a big picture stuff. And then over time I realized, you know, um, is, is this is like, you like we need we need local spaces where people are brushing shoulders with one another and everyone's actions has has consequences in that space right on a big scale you can do something horrendous in one part of the country and it has like global effects and you have no idea you know like what's going on over there like we're, you know, using palm oil for everything. And these palm, you know, like uh, forests are like destroying, you know, local uh, 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 was the ecosystems and stuff like that. Just one example. Like, so um, I, I totally agree with you. And and that's the, that, that's kind of the beauty. Yeah. I'll say beauty of interpersonal conflict. Like, because like, you're going to see that person tomorrow. You're going to see the, the, the results of what happens. And so if you don't, if you don't heal on a deep level. Um, and so creating those like, those like, you know, kind of incub- incubation spaces for those ideas, I think is, is, is super important. Obviously, um, you know, uh, as you scale, that comes into like a bigger and bigger governance, bigger and b- bigger, like dispute mechanisms, like, you know, between ethnicities, countries, stuff like that. It's a much different kind of, you know, it's, it's becomes much harder. Like, but I think keeping the spirit of the small space of like the really human deep, you know, kind of connectedness of it all, I think is like, it it has its own merits and you'll see um, in uh, just a tangent, you'll see this is emerging a lot in the business world. Like um, people are now uh, recognizing that, that um, you know, the more you scale, the more without doing it correctly, it's going like the 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 default way of operating is a command and control structure in the hierarchy, right? That's how you do it if you scale without intention. It's it's going to always default to that because somebody's got to give orders and like their biases are coming out and their what they don't know is all coming out. What they do know is coming out and the command and control. But now businesses are seeing like there's merit to kind of you know small teams interacting with one another and decentralizing as networks. Right. So that you are interacting in small interpersonal uh, groups as opposed to a very bureaucratic uh, system. So like um, for for the implications for the mediation, I think, is like replicating deep human connection, you know, as you scale up. Is uh, is is super important. I think, uh, and that's that's the beauty of small spaces. Because the idea was that that's why I said I call it the world mediation circle. That everyone it feels part of the larger whole, but mm-hmm. you're creating it at your at your small community or school, wherever it is. So you've got that uh, environment going. But look, the long term and the larger role of the people with the mediator mindset as leaders 
is what I'm looking at. And then that is when the whole thing gets connected on the larger global level. When you have these people at the local level who have that reasonable voice out there, because like I keep saying that activism, advocacy, politics on one side and reasonable voices on one side and be it a small circle. I'm not saying, look, the thing, thing idea is that within, I keep talking about myself, that I live in this bubble, but my bubble is also a world. <laughs> so in my yeah. world, I can take care of all those things that we keep talking about. I'm okay with that. I don't, I mean, I'm here, not here. I can't say I will create change the whole world, but at least if am I changing my world? Am I bringing in what I want to bring in into my world? So if everyone, if we do that on an individual and then on the community and all, I think we somewhere we will see something happening. And I'm saying it's a work in progress and we'll take it as it comes. It's not something mm-hmm. which I also, I mean, I, there is a certain vision that I have there, but it can go whatever way. I mean, we, so it's, we'll take it as we, it comes, but we'll start, I mean, say in organizations, when I talk about communities, I say an organization is a community. So we mm-hmm. set that environment there and a mediation circle. What is it that we are saying? Identify people within your own community, within your own organization and create that circle around them rather than this, again, this whole colonization concept that we'll, some, someone from outside is going to bring in something and right. we bring in a person from outside. I'm saying it's not required. It's all there. Those people are there. It's just that we haven't been able to value them and bring them out we'll just do that that's the starting point let's just bring them out and whatever no, no. else needs to be done i'm telling you in terms of skill development and all there is enough material available <laughs> no dearth of material there so that's how i mean to go about it because i'm saying colonization of mediation and dispute resolution continues it continues Mm-hmm. And that I think it's something which is not going to help on the long term. And then it's going to, I feel it's going to, like I said, this class distinction is going to come out. And that for me, if I keep giving numbers to people, I don't know if you know the population of India. Do you have any idea what the population of India is? Just a vague figure. Um, 1.3 billion? Yeah, it's almost yeah, 1.4. And out of that, 1.4. 60% are living in rural areas in in India. So you almost a billion people out there. Wow. And if you start making them feel inferior in relation to, I'm just talking about mediation, that village mediator who's been there and people have been going to this person for years and suddenly you say, oh, that's not a mediator. This one that we have certified, this is the mediator. So you, this class distinction, that inferiority, superiority complex that you will develop, I don't think is going to be good for mediation for sure. So I'm trying to break that chain before it becomes, because India still, nothing much has happened there. And same thing with Africa. I'm not looking at it. And I'm sure, I mean, South America, still there is a little more activity there. So, but I think, I don't know, but I think these areas, quite a lot of activity can be done and large populations, large populations, which we can help out. Yeah. One thing I'll add to that is like, uh, you know, um, getting this information out there is like super important because like for us in the Western world and are living in our own bubble, we don't know, like, we don't know what, what new, there's some amazing things happening all around the world with like, um, with, with exactly what you're talking about. And we're so kind of, we're still just like pushing certain very Euro Eurocentric frameworks here. Um, there's one one group that I follow called the Global Tapestry of Alternatives, and they talk about like different ways. You know, there's this combination of like human organization with environmental, uh, uh, you know, sustainability, not just sustainability, but ecological harmony kind of thing. So, um, so I think like you know, as as you're building this this circle, like I think we would be so much interested. Right now, what I'm you know, one of the big things I'm looking at is uh, like I was saying earlier, this whole like. Uh, creating democratic processes for designing diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and kind of really getting like people's voices out there and really understanding and connecting. Um, and all of the, the frameworks for like workplace democracy or participatory design are still like, I still see them and they're, they're still like, they don't feel quite right because like, it's still like, it seems like it's replicating the same type of system we're trying to avoid, right? Like, um, very procedural, very bureaucratic, very like clunky, uh, exa- to an exhausting degree, not organic, not like nat- like doesn't feel natural. 
And so I'm looking, I, I myself am looking for different ways of kind of human interaction outside of these, you know, colonized frameworks. And so it's, it's becoming very difficult. So the more I think what you're doing is super important because like we're kind of starved for it, right? Even in the West, we're, we're exhausted with our own frameworks, right? And I'm saying that like, you know, I'm not European, but like, uh, um, we're, we're tired. Like it's, it's so incredibly exhausting. Colonization is so incredibly exhausting. Like supremacy culture is so exhausting. And we just want something that's natural, that frees up our time to spend more time building human connections, spending time with family, like participating in our, in our uh, community and in, in activities and stuff like that. But we can't because we're so hyper-focused on our jobs. It's taking too much of our time. We don't have time to rest and everything is like, layered and unnecessarily complex right and so the more we can localize the more we can come in and like distribute work to the point where i'm not working 80 hours and somebody else is jobless right it's like we're all kind of working into these these build like picking a portion of our day into our communities and then spending the rest of the time for leisure and, and, and like activity like human connection and stuff like that I think it's super important. And the more you kind of like explore that and figure that out for what people are doing in, in parts of Africa, in India, you know, Iran, Afghanistan, like, uh, um, you know, China, Russia, and, and Brazil, like all these things, the more, more of these things come out. I think people, people are very interested in that here, you know, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. But I think that's the thing. I think when we bring it all out, and because look, this is that whole humanistic aspect, which is why I put that word there, that whole humanistic approach, mm -hmm. people will connect to it because finally, that is one thing that we all have in common, <laughs> that we, it is easy to connect to. Every other thing, yeah. like you said, the processes and everything is, a, I mean, let's call it, I mean, let's, you're using inhuman, but okay, maybe, <laughs> but <that's, laughs> that just takes away the human aspect of it. And how mm -hmm. can we create a structure where the, the human aspect of it is not there and it's a, it's a whole process, not looking at the individual or a community or anything it's a, just a process so that way i think on the other end the human aspect of it everyone can connect we even look i have people from all over the world who come on to my shows and we how many countries but i'm telling you they, i've never met people i've never met you before but we start off on a very basic thing because we're connecting on a very basic human to human very, connection we have nothing there is nothing around it nothing else which we, they, we don't i mean there's no, no nothing more than us on the screen together nothing more to it so mm -hmm. I think that, that connection I found with everyone. Okay, I'm a little selective, <laughs> not everyone. So I'm selective <laughs> of that part. Look, I, I have to be a little careful because of the fact that, look, there is a certain energy that a person brings in and sure. you want to spend time I, with I get good that. energy. You want to spend time with good energy. You can't you can't just do that. So that I'm a little selective about. But mm -hmm. I'm saying I've wonderful people that have come in and have had, and that's what keeps me going on in terms of time aspect of it. You just don't want to stop because you're having a wonderful conversation. So that I think that human connection that we have is easy to get to. All those other layers that have been put on us, I think that way that online world has been good for us. That mm -hmm. all you're not bringing all that into this space at all. It's just you and me on a screen. Nothing else is being judged. Nothing else is being engaged. And that I think is what I want to take forward because I found it. If there's a I don't know. Let's call it an equalizing factor there. Something there. So I think that part of it is something which is working. And I think because now it's on individual individual thing as we keep creating those circles, getting the right people in. I'm not saying that it's going to be, I mean, we want to get the right people into it. And we'll be careful. We'll take it step by step. I mean, we don't have to create this whole circle, the whole world together. But yeah, Andrea's here. And there's also a wonderful person. Andrea, you'll have to unmute yourself. For sure. Yeah, mean. Okay. Sorry, I'm, actually, I'm actually driving. I'm on my way back from somewhere at the moment, but I didn't want to miss. So I said I, I'd log in. So excuse me. I have to concentrate on the road, but I am listening. Okay. So you, you, you've I heard Farzine introducing himself. Have you done that? I, I didn't know. I didn't. I literally just have logged in this second. Okay. 
So Andrea has basically been on various shows, of course, the symposium last year, In Conversation with the Beautiful Mind, Symposium on Heart, Soul, Spirituality, Women Very and cool. Mediation. So she's been there. And I mean, you'll, when you meet her, you'll know the person that she is. She's from Ireland. And of course, she had spoken about intergenerational trauma aspect of it. Andrea, I've been mm-hmm. talking about that to everyone about what you were saying there. And that's why I wanted you to come yeah, in for a gym session because he was talking about intergenerational trauma based on obviously the residential schools and what they went through oh. and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, sorry about that, but I was actually out of mediation when I got that message through. So, um, I couldn't, and then I didn't want to miss it again today, so I said I'll log in while I'm actually driving and just good. listen good. in, you, if that's okay. No, no, good. That Fazin is, of course, he has really interesting things to tell us, so you plus listen to him. And she's not Anna, she's Andrea, so she, I don't know, who, who's, who, who, what have you logged in? Oh, sorry, Vikram, Anna is my daughter, and she was obviously using Zoom on my phone, so that's what's happened. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Funny. So basically, basically, what we were talking about, uh, Andrea was, uh, of course, my that world mediation circle, and of course, Farzine agrees with me as to the direction that is taking. Of course, it's a work in progress. All of us are going to sit together and we're going to go work on it. So he has some interesting ideas about local and how to create that. So Farzine, please. Uh, yeah. So first off, uh, hi, uh, pleasure to meet you, Andrea. Um, I'm. Oh, you too. Uh, just a quick background. I am a, uh, quote, diversity, equity, and inclusion practitioner based in the United States. I call myself an organizational justice practitioner now. Um, uh, and we were talking about kind of like how my, my specific life experience, like kind of, uh, influenced, uh, my thoughts and, uh, a lot of like my, um, drive to kind of break systems of power and make you know, localize things and really focus on interpersonal deep connections and human interactions and things like that. And how that sort of local spaces kind of, uh, can, can, can be the catalyst for, for, um, uh, greater global, hopefully global harmony with ourselves and the environment. And so, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, my, I think the, the, the main thing, um, to remember, like, uh, um, or to, to, to kind of, you know, the, my thought process essentially is fundamentally like um, understanding the nature of, of power in a space first, you know, like that's, that's both just, uh, you know, who's in the room, but also the history that has brought power to that individual and how they express it. And so, um, you know, as uh, so like one thing I would, you know, when, when you were, um, uh, mentioning kind of like starting from a blank slate is like it's it's never really a blank slate right I mean so like even like uh, a lot of the times and, and this is something I come across a lot is like we want to create these democratic spaces where you know voices uh, are there you know everybody's able to contribute and participate in the design and development of a particular action or a system right um, so that that initial starting point doesn't clear everything that has come before it right so without a without a fundamental understanding of like history sought law society all these things that got us to the point we're at right now you 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 risk really replicating those old systems in the new one you know without addressing patriarchy without addressing global colonization and racism without addressing all these things and that's why like my main thing is like um it, is that it, it democracy in itself is inadequate it has to be a justice led you know democracy it has to be a uh repertory democracy right um i had this post on 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 you know uh on linkedin the other days like uh without that kind of framework of addressing the past and addressing you know truly getting at that we're talking about mediation truly getting at the root of things democracy just becomes participatory oppression Right. So um, I think like, you know, what if like if we want to make spaces truly inclusive to multiple cultures, we have to have healing at the core. We have to address our past and what we've done and how we contributed to systems of oppression. Um, 
and then be extremely mindful of not replicating that in any new space that we're we're co-designing, right? So um, I think like, you know, I know we're at time, uh, but um, I think that that's the that's the main thing I've been thinking about as of late because I got really really into um, you know democratic governance and learning all these new things that are you know new systems that are coming up and. The more I read it and the more I talk to uh, particularly people of color and, you know, uh, people around the world who have been minoritized, it's like, yeah, that's, that's cool. You know, you know, that does seem inclusive, but most of these spaces are typically also extremely Eurocentric in their foundation and the, the values that they operate under. Like they, it's, it's like democracy as a novelty, not true democracy. Exactly. If we were to have true democracy, we'd have all these other things. So yeah. that's the that's the final. And and and, and it's uh, Andrea's time. Time is not a, no no. She's not. It's not her session. She's just come to see. Oh you. okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh good. <laughs> but I think in terms of democracy, if I see in where is the democracy? Why? Because U.S. and right. India are not democracies, according to me. I mean, that's my theory. Because when I look course, at yeah. I look at statistics, I look at the vote voting pattern. Out of the entire votes of the country in the U.S. 33% is what the president, the current president has got. 33% did not vote. Yeah. That's yeah. how you are structured. India, 25% of the votes of the country is the government. 40% did not vote. So more people <laughs> do not vote or almost the equal number do not vote in the US and the governments are formed. So definitely the whole concept is going to be that divide and rule. Again, it's just colonization in another name. It's not mm -hmm. democracy. I don't call it democracy. I've been talking about, I keep saying this because we're fooling ourselves if we do that because mm -hmm. then everything then is discussed around democracy. When you're not a democracy, how do you discuss things around democracy? So first create the structure that is a democracy and then let's see how it works because because obviously it's arithmetic. This group will give me 5% of the votes. This one will give me 10. So let's patch this up together. Now I've got 33%. I will form a government. Obviously you're going to leave 67 behind, 67% behind because you don't need them. You just mm -hmm. need this 33 to get your government going. So I think this is where I feel that we are going, getting it wrong totally. It's another way of colonization. The government's another yeah. colonized government. Minority ruling over the majority. That's the way it is. The numbers have increased. That's all. The earlier, mm -hmm. maybe it was 5% of the population going <laughs> ruling over it. Maybe that's become 33. But I don't think that aspect has changed. And Andrea definitely will have something to say on that. Andrea, do you have something to say on this? Um, no, I, do you know what resonated with me? At, you know, at at the end, at the end piece of that conversation, I know what you were saying, Fikram, but about addressing all the issues and not being afraid to address them, and not being afraid to kind of have those conversations, and that kind of ties in with the effects of, say, the trauma that we were talking about, and how trauma is carried from generation to generation. And if we don't look at the structures and the hurt and the pain that was caused because mm -hmm. of structure, well, then how is it possible to ever create a structure that is going to be better than that? So it's going right. to be underlined. It's going to be there. It, it's going to just maybe be hiding itself for a while until such time that it feels it can kind of, you know, things are unstable enough to push its head out again and it might get that support again. Um, so I think that's why it's so important to actually address all those issues, address the trauma, address the hurt, you know, have the acknowledgement, say, for the wrongdoing on, you know, whichever side that is on or things that were done wrong. Um, and then only then can you really even start the structure of what is a true democracy. Because mm -hmm. unless we go back down to that route, unless we look at the pain unless we help people heal from that and move on from that, well, then there will never be a true democracy because once there's hurt there, there's always somebody who's going to try and gain power for the sake of power because power makes a sense, gives a sense of feeling better. You know, the power makes up for the, the trauma that might be there or the hurt that might be there or whatever that's been carried on through generations and generations. So for me, I think it's all interlinked. Everything that we've said, and even what you're talking about there, Vikram, about, you know, there's not really a true democracy. And, and I don't think that can ever really happen in any country until everybody is brave enough 
to say, do you know what? Actually, what happened in our histories is not OK. And we're still hurting and we're still damaged by it. And some of us, you know, you know, whatever part of that equation maybe did things wrong, but let's learn from it. Um, and, and then let's build from that, build from a sense of acknowledgement and maybe a sense of wrongdoing. You know, and and when we can be okay with that, but we have to be okay to receive that information as well. You know that we're the ones being told that there was that we're the ones that did wrong, or that we were the one that wrong was done on. That we can actually accept that because sometimes that's hard information to actually accept, even if it's to do with your ancestors. You know, because they are part of who your identity is. And um, so it's about letting go of some of our individual identities so that we can work together mm. as a connected a, a connected community a connected country a connected world a connected everything so um yeah so that look maybe i'm a bit ambitious but that that's what i think it's going to take to actually have that sense of true democracy Farzeen has a lot to say there, but before we need to tell you, <laughs> with, the, with the positive energy that you bring in, things will happen. Because Farzeen, I keep saying, <laughs> she brings in this positive energy and that's what that's what the I whole concept for my yeah, You can actually feel it. That's the but yeah, she, yeah. that's what she brings in. So Farzeen, please, so much Andrea has put out there, so much for you to say. I, I the only thing is like I, I wish we'd joined earlier. I think we, we were <laughs> we're so very much aligned on so many things. And uh I think, actually, I will say this. I think the fact that we have to, like, the, the immediate thought is, hey, this might be lofty. This might be like, you know, kumbaya. That is also colonization, right? Mm -hmm. like, we can't afford anything else at this moment. Like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, decades ago, and even then we couldn't afford it because, like, the world mm -hmm. was oil, but, like, but like literally we have this entire thing collapsing on us, which is uh, the, the brink of, you know, we're on the brink of you know, global mm. human civilizational collapse due to climate change and, and things like that. Like we, we like, it's not something that's like pie in the sky. You know, we say that mm. here, like some, some lofty goal that we're trying to get, like, this is the only way forward, right? Mm. We have, there is like, Collective action is like the only thing that we have in our toolbox mm. anymore, right? right. Um, and so, to be able to get to a point where, um, where we are moving toward a common shared uh, conception of a humanity without harm, mm. I totally, absolutely agree. You have to address, right. you know, where you uh, like you, the harm you faced and the harm. Uh, you've perpetrated on others and mm -hmm. uh, to, to make sure that you interrupt and break the, those cycles and yeah. like honest conversation is the only, only path forward. Well, before you joined, we were talking about how like um, in my experience in mediation spaces is like uh, um, it's a, it's an extremely uh, clunky bureaucratic procedural process that doesn't really give you a true healing space. It's mm -hmm. like it's it's a commodification of the process of um, of mediation, where it's like it's almost like like there's an there's a there's a break in the cog of the machine that you have to fix yeah. that in order for the machine to work, and that's how we think of you know mm -hmm. conflict. It's mm -hmm. like here's something we have to fix so that we can go back to you know stressing ourselves out or right or like, <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah or at the home instead of Hey, you know, the machine can shut down for a minute. Let's let's really the focus is this this the space this this between people with their humanity, oh, this connection, like that kind of thing. So it's it's a it's a, like the mediation uh, has like you know same with diversity, equity, inclusion becoming in, in, industrialized, right? Yeah. And so there's this like input output sort of mentality of it, like mm -hmm. production consumption. It's all part of that cycle, yeah. and it dehumanizes it all. Yeah. And so it, like, yeah. Yeah, it becomes a checkbox exercise. Um, right. And and I think for me, so, so I have a different experience in that a lot of what I would do would be working with families or couples or, you know, that have kind of broke down. So the very core of what I do has to be from the heart or otherwise that connection won't be made because, you know, you're probably meeting with people 
at their most vulnerable stage and everything about it is emotional because it's those deep, you know, deep connected relationships within the family system. But what I think is missed sometimes in the workplace and in communities is they too are systems of relationships and they mm-hmm. might be called a family and they might not be called, you know, they might be called a workplace, but there's still a system of relationships. And at the end of the day, totally. with relationships, the heart matters. So if you don't bring that in or, you know, if we're used as a mechanism to get from A to B or to increase productivity, well, then actually, you know, what's happening is the people that we're mediating are missing out on a golden opportunity to learn something, to learn something about conflict and maybe even to learn something about themselves. Um, and so, you know, what all we can do is keep on trying, you know, and, and not to give up. I think that's what it is. It's about not to give up that this is a better way and to try and just, I suppose, like what Vikram's doing here, just kind of spread the word and get people so that mediation is something that comes first to mind as opposed to disciplinary procedures, as opposed to, you know, going to HR, mm-hmm. those things that were, you know, diversity and inclusion. Well, let's not be afraid to actually sit down and talk about race. Not, let's not be afraid to sit down and say, well, what do I find uncomfortable about your religion? And why right. does it make me feel uncomfortable? So why does somebody else's religion make me feel uncomfortable? Uh, and, and that might be, well, I've been watching TV for the last 10 years telling me you're going to do something to me. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so my brain has stored that information and that information right. is there as a warning signal. And so even without a country, you know this by doing diversity, even without a conscious decision, our brain has always predicted, already predicted who that person is. And unless we bring that information that's stored to the front, it's like I was explaining it to somebody today. It's like um, your mobile phone. And in the background, there's loads of different apps going on in the background. And sometimes those apps become obsolete. We don't need them anymore. And sometimes they need updating. But unless we go into our phone and check what apps we have, and check to see what needs to be updated Mm. and check to see what needs to be removed, our phone won't work to its full capacity. And we won't have, we won't gain all the valuable stuff that our phone can do for us, or we won't have the benefit of new apps. So I I think, yeah, yeah, it's a great way to kind of start exploring. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a way to explore kind of our own operation systems and how Mm -hmm. we can, you know, update them, I suppose. And not be afraid to update them. I think that's the key, you know, that we're not afraid to move away from our old way of thinking. I think, I think the important thing is that everything generally, again, this colonized, colonization aspect, that everything has been dehumanized. I think mm-hmm. so, so that is what we have to work on, get the human touch in, the humanistic part of it, which I was taking for Zine through my world mediation circle and my mediation circles, the thought process behind it. So that's my way of looking at it. I'm, 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 I'm saying that it might not be everyone to understand it at the same time, but some people do. If you just bring those, just this conversation that we're having, it's just what three of us here, but there is something nice about it. It just, and if someone mm-hmm. listens to it, they don't have to be part of it. They might not understand the aspect of this conversation today, but at least if they listen to it, something will resonate somewhere. So I just think that's what we need to do. Just bring those good people together, have that mm-hmm. conversation. And these are reasonable voices which are not affected by anything. I mean, both of you are not affected by any aspect. There are no prejudices there. There are no biases there. You really want to do something good. And that's all we need to bring together. That's the way I'm looking at it. I mean, that's the way I've been doing and I've mm-hmm. found that it does help. There are people in this world, let me tell you, who actually listen and they get inspired or it touches them somewhere. And I get those messages and I'm saying, okay, I didn't know <laughs> that someone there was listening to this, but that's wow. good. It's, there's something happening there. So that's all. The, so that, uh, that's the idea. Yeah. yeah, I think that's what we're doing, Vikram, it. isn't it? It's about planting a seed, yeah. you know, and, and that's all it is. If, if we plant plant the seed for people just to question, you know, th- their, their way of thinking. And if that causes a shift, even the slightest shift, well, then we've achieved something. Yeah. And the second thing that's happening, which I was telling Farzine, is why do I write the country there? 
because these stereotypes that people have about people from a country so at least someone from ireland they have met but we let them meet andrea let them hear andrea because <laughs> she for me represents what i would want a person from ireland to be <laughs> that's oh it. thank you yeah. so much <laughs> and that's what i asked farzeen because he was earlier right we were writing only usa there but of course with discussion with him azerbaijan came out iran came out and all those are important things to come out and they should be out there mm-hmm. we should we don't need to not put it there so those are things we need to put out there i mean that's but farzeen has something to say sir farzeen please oh uh, no no I, i was just i was agreeing with uh, uh, you all and, and i think like um no i agree i mean like we're we're multifaceted like we're uh you know a lot of what we believe are socializations but we also have the individual capacity to break those socializations and we all, we have our own individual humanity as well so um i don't want to steer the, the the conversation in a different way but i think it this touches up on a lot of conversations that i've been having on this like idea of like individual versus collective solutions and like uh it's you know we have these like also comes from colonization it's like this culture is this way and that culture is that way and it in in your like I mean aggregate some things you can say about that like there's a you know some some cultures have developed systems where it's much more collectively approached uh you know uh like a solution to a specific issue sure but that doesn't mean that like it's not an ism like the fact that in individualism and then collectivism or isms like are 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 weird to me because it's a combination right like mm. we're such individuals in this sea of 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 like cultural systems and dynamics that we operate in a lot of my culture shaped who i am a lot of like the experiences shaped who i am but i also that doesn't mean that everybody who's kind of in my space and have experienced the same things i have is exactly like me right yeah. like you know so um so we have to give space for these things right and, right. and the fact that like uh uh you know like you were you were saying Andrew you just kind of like uh look look at the media and you see um you know these stereotyped images of yeah. repeated over time of certain population wants this they want this and they're trying to do this and they want this from us and they want to take yeah. that from us and so like um and then you 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 know you actually have these deep human connections with folks and then you realize wow they this Uh, that's mm-hmm. completely challenges and everything that i've i've mm-hmm. learned about and hopefully as vikram said hopefully like um this age of uh technological kind of advancement allows us to i know that it's not always the case but allows us to have like deeper conversations like this and actually connect on levels that mm-hmm. like you know we we realize there's more commonality in what we're looking for we want we don't want to we don't want to you know some people are workaholics okay but most of us like want leisure time want to spend time <laughs> with our friends want to just have good share a good meal <laughs> and like share different tastes from around the world and st- and that's uh, metaphorically obviously but like um and also like i love food so i always bring back to food but um <laughs> but so i think that that's you know like having these spaces i think is so kudos to y'all for doing this and like uh for having these spaces because like it, you know the energy is good here and i mm. i even even though i'm not like next to you i can feel it in this virtual space and so like the more we replicate these things and the more we actually kind of start shifting through things and we like okay so here's a here's a in a very very precise like uh sort of minutia of it here's a place where we can connect where we align and let's let's kind of build on that and then so uh So all that to say I you know I'm I'm actually at time I have to start heading out but um but you know I I would love to continue these types of conversations uh, yeah but I think but that's the whole idea behind that circle concept that I'm saying look that this is that's it's the circle is in a way it's my circle definitely it's a, I me myself situation only because someone has to put some people together and that's my gauge of people yeah. that I bring together and that's how it's going to grow they definitely that mm-hmm. i am going to be part of who comes into the circle for sure that's sure. true i'm clear about that because i these conversations are sensitive we, we might be having this here but it is going out and 
who gets comes in and what they say is really important i mean we have it we, so that's why i have to I call it control maybe <laughs> that's, yeah. right. that's the that's the control give me that much control that's all i'm saying <laughs> who comes in is something that i would look at but after that then uh, when you get the right people i'm telling you the conversations go in the right way so uh, that's mm. what what it's about so farzeen thank you very much if there's no. any uh, any other concluding thing that you want to put in anything you want to conclude on a certain point please Uh no if anybody wants to connect me on I'm very active on LinkedIn so if anybody wants to just look me up and connect with me I, I you know I like I love building out the network of of folks from around the world uh on LinkedIn and just having good conversations so feel free to message me um but other than that I, this was an absolute pleasure like one of my most favorite conversations just so like flowy organic uh and um uh, and I'm really really loving the spaces that you're building Vikram I think that it's a uh, very very much needed and um pleasure meeting you as well uh, andrea i hope that we uh, have pleasure to mine further conversation yeah yeah so thanks again this was this was an absolute pleasure i appreciate it thank you thank you for zeen for coming in and of course the schedule has the link to his pro- his linkedin profile of course andrea's also so you can connect there so thank you very much for zeen lovely talking to you and see you soon i will yeah. definitely add to the circle feel and thank you all right thanks for having me all right take care thanks Bye. thank you thanks andrea thank you for thanks coming in